the, uh, the, the time that I've sort of spent really looking into this area, you can see some of the institutions I'm, I'm associated with. I put CAS at the top for obvious reasons. Um, but it's, it's been an ongoing sort of project, really, over the last, what, 15 to uh, 18 years, really, since the uh, since uh, at Birkbeck College they founded a project called CASH, Computer Arts, Context, Histories, etc., to look at specifically the British contribution to the development and evolution of computer-based art. And with that sort of 50-plus year history, which surprises a, a lot of people, even surprised me when I sort of first started researching, that it went back quite that far. And so uh, in 2010, uh, we had, this was the, actually a follow-up project called CATS, Computer Art and Technocultures, but we actually had a, um, a, a conference here called uh, Ideas Before Their Time. And uh, Jerry Gardner, my uh, sort of uh, colleague and um, senior research fellow on that project, is also here this evening, which is very appropriate. Brian Reffin Smith, um, a long time sort of theorist and uh, computer artist himself. You see, he's, he's there as a zombie. He's a great fan of pataphysics, a sort of uh, approach to uh, sort, of, uh, sort of rather off the wall French philosophy that also involves taking sort of brave new angles in various ways. But he, he made some very interesting comments. And looking at this sort of long history, he said, Well, there's a mine, a treasure trove, a hoard. I can't emphasize this too strongly of art ideas that emerged in the early decades of computer uh, art. I should say, aren't there, uh, that still have not uh, remotely been explored. We know how this happens. The next big thing comes along, and the zeitgeist has its demands. Things get left behind. And um, I'm reminded of this at, uh, at work at the moment at Ravensbourne. Everybody is, seems to be wandering around wearing a headset of some sort, whether it be a sort of a Vive, whether it uh, be the HoloLens, which um, I'm quite interested in. But it sort of, that takes me back to the sort of early to mid-90s when people tend to have much larger headsets that they are wandering around in, or as far as the cable would stretch, at least. And you see this sort of, if you, you know, if one's around for enough time, you see this sort of repetition, this sort of cyclical aspect as well. And I think... We're often sort of used to the idea that, that, that you know, especially computer art is something very new, that it's actually something that's sort of really strikingly sort of different and it's sort of, uh, you know, sort of hitting the, the you know, some, some sort of um, new sort of uh, audience or whatever. But in fact, it has been here before. And what I'm very interested in really is trying to tie down something of what makes it so different. Why sort of making imagery on the computer, and not just imagery, but also immersive experiences of various kinds, interactive experiences, you know, why, what sort of makes that much more, sort of m much distinct from previous art forms, and why should that sort of uh, take us into something, into a, a new realm? And I've uh, been trying to sort of pin that down for a while. These are some, some of my thoughts, you know. Is it something to do with the unusual space in which the sort of computer actually projects things? It's, sort of, uh, it's described mathematically, but we can see it through various devices. Um, you know, is it about the fact it's actually there are processes that run behind the scenes, you know, things that an artist can modify without actually perhaps just doing visual modifications, but they can change the processes and make those run differently and perhaps also get the computer to run independently and even maybe create its own art, you know, very controversially. Where could that take us in this, this age of AI? And perhaps also then the way that it changes the sort of the concepts and the, the, the use of information, the fact you can actually make something that doesn't actually have uh, necessarily a visible form visible. You know, there's, you know, information isn't inherently sort of visual, but you can make it so. And you can visualize or sort of express it in a number of different ways through the computer as well. And all those things have actually impacted uh, on, on computer art. So, you know, we try to sort of understand really where, where, where these sort of contributions are, <coughs> artificial intelligence, or is it about interconnectivity? The fact that you can collaborate a lot more easily now in different, with different people in different countries even, and actually sort of uh, tie them together in, in much larger projects. And do these then sort of impact on the conceptual sort of uh, uh, aspect too? But then that sort of brings us to an interesting question. Why, why did the first generation of computer art pioneers back in the 50s and 60s turn to, turn to the computer? Because at the time, of course, it was not really something you could take around with you under your arm. Um, it was, uh, you know, it might, might fill at least a floor of a building and perhaps three floors of, of a building. The computer was certainly not portable. It was something that you went to. You'd have to be appraised of its processes, either learning to program yourself or expressing what you're doing in programmatic forms that somebody else could actually translate that into the computer. And some time later, perhaps even a week later, you might receive out the other end of the computer, having fed something in, um, hopefully a piece of graphical output, or if things went very badly wrong, you'd just get a sort of uh, a load of error sheets and nothing else. So computer um, interaction at that time was certainly not real time. 
Um, you know, so why, why did these artists actually try and take on the computer? And I think it's partly to do with the nature of the times they were in. And we'll, we'll certainly come to um, some of the sort of earliest sort of expressions of interest in doing things with cybernetics, for instance. There were sort of metaphors and ideas, the idea of the computer as an electronic brain that sort of fired some early pioneers. You know, what, what could we do with this nascent sort of artificial intelligence? Um, but also there were numerous artists who were actually very interested in the application of mathematics to art and the way that sort of different abstract forms could actually be expressed in, as, uh, you know, both on, on, on sheets but also then they could, uh, they, these forms could actually be described mathematically and if the computer could do that then it could actually enter their art in, in various ways. But I also think that there's also an urge to colonise new spaces with creative activity. It's something that you see on, on cave walls and, and other things and if you're given a space that's described you know, sort of conceptually rather than perhaps physically, then some people will think of ways to fill that with imagery and, and, uh, and sort of make, make, make use of that too. Frieden Arker, who really goes back to the start of this era, he was um, working in Stuttgart in the 1960s with a German professor called Max Benzer. And Benzer was very interested in the ways that potentially aesthetic, um, well, um, well, aesthetic objects and artifacts could be expressed as information. And many of us might sort of think of that as a very reductive sort of possibility that you could actually sort of take take a take a work of art and turn it into some sort of you know essentially into an algorithm. But actually, um, Benzer had his reasons for thinking that was the case, and um, although often challenged by uh, um, you know, a, a, a number of other artists to explain himself, actually he still sort of hewed to the idea that it was possible, rather like the constructivists, to sort of create something mathematical. And so Frieden Arca then was one of the first artists to experiment with um, computer plotters, and he expressed a lot of works. In fact, he was very influenced by Powell Clay. I shall bring up that connection soon. But at some point, um, Narka said this. He said early computer art was revolutionary, but at the same time traditional. It was traditional insofar as it resulted in paperwork that you could put on the walls of the gallery. Uh, you know, why use the most modern technology in order to generate the most traditional formats of the art world? Um, but at the same time, it was revolutionary on all other accounts. It was a radical turn to an aesthetic to the object. The individual human subject simply <coughs> didn't exist anymore once he or she had set the boundary conditions for the image to be computed, i.e., you could externalise the making of the image. You could actually, once you'd set the programme in motion, you could actually tell the machine to go and create several, mul multiple variations of it, and the human would step back. And that was something that Laszlo Mahoynage, one of the uh, members of the Bauhaus, who, who later went on to found the, the new Bauhaus in Chicago, that was one of his sort of first ideas way back in the 1920s. He designed what he called telephone paintings. And the basic sort of route that he made the telephone paintings, this was about 1921, was he would have a, a, gr a grid of squared paper. And he had the order book from a, um, I think it was an enamel factory that had specified colours and numbers. And he would basically talk down the telephone to somebody at the factory and describe, using the grids, exactly what he wanted to produce. And then out would come, at the other end, um, a finished work, a telephone painting, which was actually described in the way that, uh, that, that he had wanted. So as he said, it, it, it was like, as he, as he described it, like playing chess by correspondence. And he wanted to take the human hand out of making the image, because he thought this was more appropriate for the mechanical age that apparently the sort of making of these forms was somehow more um, apposite for, for a time of, um, you know, even for early telegraphy and telephones and the, the early communications technologies of the time. So that was part of, you know, that was passed down to the 1960s and people like um, Frieda Narka. So there we are. Computer art in its early years, says Frieda, was radically rational. It was done in thinking, not in dreaming. Computer art remains, to him at least, a rational art of the object even though its appearances of today have hardly anything in common with its early years. Now, I jump to 1986, because here's a point, I think, where some of the things that we now think of as, as computer-based art were made possible. Um, you obviously recognise Andy Warhol, and I'm sure many of you here will remember the Amiga. That was the first computer I sort of got hold of when I was young, and so it retains a certain sort of... Uh, I think, you know, a, a certain sort of spot of affection. And in many ways, it was the first home computer, along with the Atari ST, um, that really dealt very well with graphics. And, in fact, multimedia in the early days, video and other things were made possible, even in the very slow and sort of rather uh, pixelated format. And what you see there is actually the launch of the Amiga um, in 19... It would have been 1985. This was actually... The, the magazine came out in 86. And Warhol was actually... Um, 
requested by Commodore as part of their launch event to uh, make use of the digitization capabilities of the old Amiga. And, um, and in fact, you can see there on the screen, Debbie Harry. And this was part of the idea was that uh, Warhol was uh, given a new sort of amount of creative freedom by using an Amiga to, uh, to, to, to basically sort of turn a digitized image of Harry into something resembling one of his prints. And um, he said, in fact, um, you know, the, the, he was interviewed in the books and, 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 and um, in, in, the, um, in the magazine, I should say. And the interviewer said, do you think it will push the artist, the computer? Do you think that people will be inclined to use all the different components of the art, music, video, etc.? And Warhol said, well, that's the best part of it. I guess you can. An artist can really do the whole thing. He can make a film with everything on it, music and sound and art, everything. And um, although in some respects he regarded what he was doing as a kind of a sketch um, and a very sort of direct sort of use of the computer, and in fact, and you can see that the pixelated Warhol, multiple sort of regression of the images on the other side, um, what he was really sort of um, producing was something that stepped quite away from what uh, Frieden Arker was talking about. This is not so much the sort of execution of the rational, but rather using the computer as a kind of a canvas and sort of using it uh, graphically and very sort of directly. Now, I'm not sort of saying that one approach is right and the other wrong, but what is interesting is that in the early years of computer art, there was a sort of a striving towards um, the mathematical, rational sort of side, and when it became possible through technology to actually interface directly and get that sort of real-time feedback, then it opened up different possibilities, <coughs> and especially the sort of idea that you could perhaps sort of incorporate a, a, a number of different forms and, and media into um, sort of one device, simply because it was possible to do, through, do so through software. So I think the, the Warhol moments, although there were people using it in, in these sort of ways before, this also marked a moment when this sort of technology became much more widely available. And I think particularly, that, that's why I'm, I'm not sort of pointing at the Macintosh, I'm not sort of pointing at some of the other things that were happening. I think actually Warhol and the Amiga is a moment, and, and we should sort of see that as a, as a start of things. I will also mention just briefly, um, Part of the interest, and dare I say, part of the sort of bugbear of studying um, old computers is the fact that they were, you know, they lasted for a certain time and then disappeared. And then all these formats and all these unusual old pieces of media and uh, many of the sort of other paraphernalia associated with them um, sort of die. And you're left actually with a load of, you know, sort of magnetic floppy disks from the mid 80s. You know, what does one do with those sort of things? You're left with. Um, obviously, lots and lots of punch cards and some um, perforated tape and magnetic tape from earlier periods as well, all for computer systems that may have lasted no more than a few, a few years before getting replaced. And there's a whole sort of area called media archaeology that is emerging, not solely for the purpose of computer art, you understand, but I mean, it's, it's something that's, that's much bigger in terms of reclaiming, you know, for instance, lost NASA tapes of the moon landings and other things that have been dredged up, and they had to, in, in that case, actually remake a a very large and very old uh, video um, machine to be able to play that. Um, but in this case, uh, Corey Archangel, who's um, a noted uh, new media artist, he does a lot in terms of hacking games, game cartridges, and other, other things to actually create uh, artworks. But so uh, here he actually collaborated with several colleagues to recover the lost sketches of Andy Warhol using um, an original Amiga. And the Warhol Foundation actually gave over several boxes of, of discs as well. And um, it was really actually through seeing the interview with Warhol that actually sort of caused Archangel to think, well, actually, those discs must be somewhere. What did Warhol do with those after his death? He didn't die much longer after, after that uh, interview, after all. And everyone wondered how much he'd actually ever done on the, uh, on the Amiga. So, in fact, um, Archangel then was able to recover that and find, um, find the new, new sort of media. So this is part of the issue as well, that the object, whatever the art object is in computer art, does it sort of subsist in what some people might print, what others might display on the internet, or what others might store on the <coughs> removable media, and um, then what does one do when that media sort of dies, or when at least the format that uh, supports that media dies. So this is part of the sort of in interest and curiosity in computer art, and that's why when I was doing a project that... Um, Look back and uh, looking into it. I mean, ironically, the things that we found easiest to curate, and the VMA, when they started their archive of computer based art, they found easiest to take over, were, of course, the paper prints. The very things that Fried and Arca said were actually very conservative in this sort of form turned out to be the things that were much the easiest to preserve. <laughs>
And in fact, they've given us a route back into then sort of having a reason to look at some of the old uh, media as well. And then now we have a sort of a, a way to sort of understand perhaps how that was used. But it's interesting that the things that are sort of most uh, dynamic are also the things that are most easily lost. And then we find also that some um, other contemporary artists are actually using the computer in interesting ways, but they don't sort of necessarily say that it's computer-based uh, work. Um, since 2005, Gilbert and George, for instance, have been using computers to composite the uh, large prints that they produce. And um, in fact, back in 2005, they did these ginkgo pictures for the Venice Biennale. And um, they basically, they, they deliberately moved away from doing anything with darkroom, they, uh, with darkroom technologies. They used those since the early 1970s. But at that point in 2005, they made a distinct break with their old film-based technology. Possibly it was for practical and sort of fairly pragmatic reasons, because to be honest, the number of labs that can develop film are sort of declining by the, by the year. And um, they were looking also, I think, at the quality and type of images that one could create with that sort of digital format. And yet we don't sort of think of them as digital artists per se. And also, I mean, David Hockney, I think, has been responsible for a lot of interest in the digital format. I mean, you know, he was sketching in his iPad, the rival spring in Woldgate, and of course he did in fact have a show uh, where he mostly displayed the works that he'd been doing with, with, with the iPad as well. But what's interesting, I think, with Hockney is that you've got an artist there who's been using throughout his career a whole range of different technologies. He was one of the first to use colour photocopying. He made a, a lot of use of Polaroids. He, he used them. Um, he went back to look at the techniques, as he said, the secrets of the old masters. He, he went back to analyse what the uh, Renaissance and other artists may have been using in terms of optical devices, especially um, you know so, some 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 of the uh, uses of the camera obscura and the camera lucida. So in fact, Hockney has been very much immersed in the world of, of technology as well. But it's interesting to see him now adapting to um, new things and also then sort of moving into this format. But it's quite a late move in many ways for him, you know, something that he's doing right, right at the, um, you know, sort of uh, the last moment, as it were. So I said that there was people who sort of prefigured the digital. Carl Clay, as I mentioned, the pedagogical sketchbook, which is a collection of uh, evolutions of the line and the way that one might sort of draw, the, you know, sort of evolve lines. That was very um, influential on uh, quite a number of artists after the Second World War. And um, Laszlo Mahoynarzy, as I said, was somebody who prefigured the uh, use of um, communications media in art in, a, in a, an interesting sort of way, and also considered what it meant to actually create art in the age of the machine, and to sort of, as it were, outsource some aspects of the, of the art sort of making process. He also made uh, photographs, um, basically just by exposing objects on, on, uh, on, on film and, and, and other things. He was basically sort of interested in the effects that one could get through, through mechanical means. And... Um, you know, how, how one can understand the sort of nature of technique and technology. John Whitney Sr. Um, evolved his own type of computer. In fact, an analog computer that was built from a, a gun-aiming um, uh, mechanical computer used on a, on a battleship. And uh, shortly after the Second World War, Whitney realized, Whitney and, and, and his brother James realized that if one um, took the mechanism that was intended really for calculating, as, as shells came flying through, you could actually calculate their trajectory and get the guns to sort of aim, and, in fact, sorry, aircraft rather than shells, you could then get the guns to predict where the aircraft would be so that its shells would hit it at the right sort of point. He realized that the precision um, calculating device, um, which, was, which was entirely mechanical in, in, in that, could be used instead to uh, move cameras around. And that if you had a static piece of artwork, you could actually turn a camera around in its X and Y axes in particular sort of paths and ways, and actually then create an animation from it. And the animations that, that he made, which all, all in many uh, encapsulated theories of, of harmony, sort of visual harmony and musical harmony, uh, hence the, uh, his, his final book on, on the digital harmony about the complementarity of music and visual art, uh, Whitney um, prefigured, I think, a, a lot of discussion about how one might sort of animate um, objects in, in, in the digital realm. But uh, his works retain a very interesting, you know, interesting aesthetic about uh, animating sort of otherwise static objects. And James Whitney produced a piece called Lapis, um, which is still um, to this day a very, very sort of interesting early piece of, of, of computer animation, even though what he was using was not a, a digital computer. And similarly, Joseph Schillinger, um, an often, over, often overlooked figure, um, Russian by birth, uh, emigrated to America, 
a friend of Leon Theremin, a sort of a musical inventor, amongst other things, who came up with a, a number of musical systems that were sort of quite widely used in, in, in some areas. But Schillinger, towards the end of his life, um, predicted that it might be possible to, again, um, create aesthetic forms through, ma through mathematical means, and therefore he came up with a number of different uh, proposals for art-making devices. And again, he thought it was possible to um, sort of turn the aesthetic form into something coded. Now this you may, I'm hoping you may have seen, um, Richard Hamilton's uh, famous collage from uh, 1956, just what is it that makes today's home so different, so appealing. And Hamilton and the independent group in the 1950s, not only interested in consumer culture, as you can see in some of the other sort of aspects, of it, including televisions and uh, tape recorders and things that were sort of part of the home technologies that were appearing after the Second World War. They were also very interested in the ways that uh, forms could be sort of changed and, and developed. Um, Darcy Thompson's famous book on growth and form was a key uh, textbook for them. But much later on, in 1992, using um, a machine called the Pontel paint box, which was uh, much used in, in, in television graphics, Hamilton then remade the um, original uh, 56 collage with things that he felt were appropriate to the early 1990s. You can see that the computer has now become a thing in the house itself. You can see that uh, other elements have changed as well, and the whole sort of design is now sort of changed from the 50s to the 90s. But underlying it all is sort of uh, Hamilton's own embrace of, of, of the digital as well. And uh, the fact that his own roots took him back to a show called This Is Tomorrow at the Whitechapel, 1956 again, where in fact it was the catalogue shows the possibility for using uh, informational devices of various kinds, and that really sort of marks the sort of the beginning of the interest in, in the UK, I would say, in developing, um, of in incorporating both cybernetics and early sort of uh, electronic technologies into computers as well. I'll just mention very quickly, Ben Leposky is generally seen as the first true computer artist, but Again, he was using an oscilloscope rather than a sort of a true digital computer, but he made these rather lovely forms called oscillons. And how he did it is he took sine, uh, well, different types of waves and mixed them together to create a combinatory form that uh, would appear on the screen of the oscilloscope. And he was probably the first to realise, as he said, that these forms which only appear on the screen are somewhat like sculptures. And he said that creating something that it, it had form and it had a certain amount of depth, but it didn't really exist as such. It was actually only ever sort of seen through the screen. And he predicted that that form would actually, the sort of development of that through television and through other formats would actually become an important source of art in itself. So that's why he's usually seen as the first computer-based artist. And quite amazingly, some of the first computer art exhibitions already were starting in, well, 1965, as you can see, the, the dates are sometimes argued around, but there was certainly a, a competition for computer art um, in by the, uh, the US Journal of Computers and Automation. And Michael Knoll, who uh, won that, was actually one of the very first to experiment. He was based, on, I think, at IBM, um, Bell Labs, actually. He was, he was based at Bell Labs. And he was uh, he, he made use of what, what, what he found one day coming out of his plotter. He, he, he um, just tried to get some coordinates right. And the plotter instead uh, went somewhat haywire and produced an image that uh, he didn't intend at all. And he held us up and looked at it for some, for some time and thought, well, actually, this looks rather like abstract art. Perhaps there might be something in this if I start to, if I start to move in that direction. So quite un, un, unconscious, perhaps, of some of the other work that was taking place, Moll started to move in that direction. And Charles Shuri as well, we'll see some of his work later on. But um, he started um, working also in, in, in the US to create plotter-based works of art, too. But you can see here Stuttgart, uh, Friedenach are already sort of working there. And then in New York, Howard Wise, 1965. Um, Wise was actually a great pioneer. He, he was actually originally a salesman who'd actually made enough money to indulge then in, in his uh, interest in the arts. He was one of the first to actually perceive television as a creative medium. He uh, gave um, a lot of help to people like Nam June Paik and also um, created some of the, 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 um, the kitchen, which was actually a, a sort of early video art uh, collective in New York. He also funded that as well. So Howard Wise was something of a visionary when it came to new media art and really thought of things. In, you know, he was looking at the generation that grew up with television in the US and he wondered, well, what sort of art forms will they produce? And so uh, people like Les Levine and others who were early TV artists, and Thomas Tadlock, he um, sort of gave them space and gave them, sort of enabled them to find uh, that sort of new, new metier. But he did try also with computer art just at this point and he 
um, said, that unfortunately, he didn't sell any of the pieces that, um, that he sort of uh, put on his walls, but they would have been pieces not dissimilar to the ones that Friedman Arkell was making. So perhaps at that time, the aesthetic happened to be taken off. <coughs> but strange enough, in Zagreb, uh, New Tendencies, um, which was actually an outgrowth of an existing, well, in fact, a bit international was, 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 was later, but New Tendencies had started in the early 1960s, and there in Yugoslavia, between the sort of Eastern Bloc and the Western Bloc, in uh, Tito's Yugoslavia, um, there was a great deal of interest in resurrecting some of the ideas of constructivism, but also bringing in some new ideas about the nature of rationality and art. And a series of conferences held throughout the 1960s gradually moved towards an interest in, in the computer. And again, they sort of brought in many of the uh, sort of computer artists at the time. So these, these places basically gave a, a sort of a forum for some of that work. And this is what was recreated in, in 2008 and 9. You can see there these sort of pixelated works at the back, there's a light-based interactive piece by a guy called Vladimir Bonarchich. And all of these things really sort of show the, the direction of interest and thought at the time, um, in, uh, you know, certainly in Eastern Europe, but also then connecting up with some of these works in the West. So we jumped slightly. Well, we're jumping to 1968, but actually this was 2015, I think. No, 2014, if memory serves. It's 2014. Um... But so we see there the then director of the uh, Institute of Contemporary Arts, um, just at the road of the Mall, Gregor Muir, with Yasha Reichart. Now, Yasha was actually the curator of the show called Cybernetic Serendipity back in 1968, and we're very lucky that she's still with us. And in fact, this is also the 50th anniversary of Cybernetic Serendipity as well. And with such a sort of welter of interest in computer-based and robotic and cybernetic things happening during the 1960s. Yasha, who'd been also, she, although sort of uh, working in the UK, had been to the United States, she'd seen the work of um, a group called Experiments in Art and Technology, uh, Robert Rauschenberg and Billy Kluver and others. And she had the idea, well, what if one had a sort of um, a large gathering of all the artists and scientists and engineers who are working in this area? And what if you didn't draw a distinction between who was an artist and who wasn't? you actually allowed everybody to exhibit in some form or other and try and get some sponsorship from a major you know, corporation. They eventually got IBM on board. And um, with sufficient funding, see if we were able to sort of look at these emerging forms and understand them better. And um, that's what became the Cybernetic Serendipity in 1968. This is just an early uh, invitation. That image is quite important. Um, it's actually the, the first time that the word computer graphics was used. It was... Um, a, um, an engineer at Boeing, whose name has actually flown out of my head this very minute, so I'm sure you can find out later, but he coined the term computer, uh, computer graphics for basically what he was doing were um, three-dimensional renditions of the human form for a cockpit. They were simulating a cockpit, even back in 1961, uh, I think it was Edward Zajac, and um, they, were, they were creating these forms. But later on, obviously, within, only a few years later, they're then sort of included as part of an art show. There's a certain aesthetic to these sort of early simulations of uh, the human form, which is which is very interesting. And you probably can't see it from the back, so I'll, I'll, I'll just read out. This was what Yasha Reichardt was thinking she, when, when she set up the idea of cybernetic serendipity. And she said, cybernetic serendipity deals with possibilities rather than achievements. And in this sense, it is prematurely optimistic. There are no heroic claims to be made because computers have so far neither revolutionized music nor art nor poetry in the same way that they have revolutionized science. Um, but um, she, she says then that there are two main points which make this exhibition unusual in the context in which art exhibitions you normally see. The first is that no visitor to the exhibition uh, will know whether he's looking at something made by an artist, engineer, a mathematician, or an architect, nor is it particularly important to know the background of the makers of various robots and machines and graphics. Uh, the other point is more significant. New media, such as plastics or new systems such as visual music notation and concrete poetry inevitably alter the shape of art, the char characteristics of music and the content of poetry. The new media and new systems are taken up by those creative people whom we identify as painters, filmmakers, composers and poets. It is very rare, however, that new media and new systems should bring in their wake new people to become involved in creative activity, be it composing, music drawing or constructing or writing. This has happened with the advent of computers. The engineers of the graphic plotter, driven by a computer represented nothing more than a, a means of solving certain problems visually, have become so fascinated with the possibilities of this process 
that they've started making drawings which bear no practical application whatsoever, and for which the only real motive is the desire to explore and the pleasure of seeing a drawing materialise. Thus, people who would never have put pencil to paper or brush to canvas have started to make images, both still and animated, which approximate to what we call art and put in public galleries. Now, rather controversial, as you might imagine, certainly at the time and, and since. But there's, you know, I think a kernel of a kernel of truth to this, nonetheless, that there is a possibility that the computer can sort of bring more people in and sort of enable us, or perhaps a wider uh, sort of sense of artistic creativity. And yet, one should never sort of overlook the need to actually bring to it an aesthetic sensibility as well. So this perhaps was the sort of crux and the problem of, of cybernetic serendipity was that on the one hand the net was sort of cast much more widely. On the other hand, there was a, perhaps a justifiable pushback from artists at the time saying, well, hang on, you can't sort of just widen those sort of doors of what art might be without considering also what the aesthetics would be as well. And Sir Roland Penrose sort of points to something similar in his address as well. But the show itself was groundbreaking. I mean, it really did bring in a whole range of things. Just, just in this picture alone, there's actually one of the very first computer sculptures by a guy called Robert Mallory. Um, he was making layered... Um, computer milled pieces back in the, the mid 1960s. It was called Plot 2. And next to it is um, a machine by uh, Jean Tangley, who famously made these sort of art machines that <coughs> destroy themselves gradually and break down. It was sort of intended as, as a commentary uh, on, on, on industry. And at the back, you see images by uh, Charles Shuri, um, we'll see them in more detail in a second, um, that are actually um, plotter based transformations of human faces into, into other forms. There we are, you can see. Some of those there as well. So you can see cheek by jowl in the uh, what was what was then a new exhibition space for the ICA in, in the Mall. You, and of course there's a, a tape unit there as well. That was part, I think, of the um, a plotting machine. You can see that. So that was another first was to bring elements of the computer into the gallery as well. So cybernetic serendipity 50 years ago was thinking about the range of creative possibilities that not only the computer but also many other. Uh, technological systems would unleash, but particularly in terms of data and robotics and um, independently active forms. The colloquy of mobiles, which is actually part of these very large uh, fiberglass uh, objects in, in basically turning in the ceiling, it was actually an interactive art piece built by Gordon Pask, uh, the pioneer cybernetics um, thinker and, and, and developer that um, George was worked with for some time. And Pask's interest really was in the concept of conversation and the way that you might enter into a conversation with, well, essentially artificial intelligence, or, or at least m machines that, that you've you got, you got to know. So in the case of the colloquy of mobiles, he designated some parts of it as male and other parts as female. And the point was to actually encourage them to sort of discuss with each other and start to sort of have, have some sort of in, in, internal conversation. But the human was an important part because I think it was the males would emit a beam of light. And what the humans had to do was to actually get in there with a mirror and turn it to face the females, and eventually, if it hit the right sort of photoelectric spot, the things would start to would start to revolve as well. The work that the work would sort of take take on life, and uh, slightly you know, eccentric as befits some of Gordon Pass work, but still, that sort of sense of a conversation was, was very important. So, again, a very different sort of work from other things that you found there. And it's that sort of idea of interactivity that I think is is, is an important aspect of <laughs> another part of what makes computer art rather different. And, um, you know, this is hinted at in the concept of cybernetic serendipity, sort of chance interactions, chance sort of findings. And one of the artists who exhibited there was, um, he made this piece called Sound, the Sound Activated Mobile. What it basically was was a series of microphones in a, in a fiberglass head. And it had basically a, a handmade circuit that would allow it to determine the direction that sounds were coming from. And a few inbuilt behaviours that if you spoke to it rather quietly, it would lean in to hear what you were saying better, and if you shouted out it, it would sort of rear back and try and sort of move away. And just from those few inbuilt behaviours, and because of the nature of the sound, especially in the gallery situation, a lot of apparently complex behaviours started to manifest themselves. And this thing was, you know, you can see here a crowd of, a crowd of guys just sort of interacting with it, you can see it's turning to face one of them and the other. There's a lot of apparent um, intelligence in something that's actually quite a silly, you know, it's a simple immersion system, as it were. But the artist behind that, who went on to make a much bigger work called The Sensor, was uh, Edward Ignatovich, um, a Polish, uh, Polish immigrant who'd um, come, come to um, the UK during the Second World War, 
um, studied for a while at um, the Slade School in Oxford and um, became something of a, he started doing some sculpting work under Henry Moore, but then he left during the 1950s, just went into furniture design. And during the 1960s, he had a kind of a revelation that one could use hydraulic systems and simple um, basically microphones and directional sort of radar to create artworks that mimicked in some way the um, activities of animals and that one could actually see really how, what's the range of movement you needed to actually make something that was lifelike in some sense. So that was uh, the starting point for what became a very big piece indeed called the Sensor, which was commissioned by Philips. Uh, the Philips Corporation built a kind of, um, rather, rather like Disney has their sort of uh, future, uh, the Epcot Center in, 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 in Disney World, I think that's the right one. Um, so Philips wanted to have a sort of showcase for the future, as seen by Philips in the 1960s. There was a big flying saucer shaped building called the Evolion, which was in Eindhoven. But they needed a centerpiece for it that wasn't necessarily just a sort of another sort of bit of gadgetry that Philips had. And through their, their designer, they got to hear about um, Ignatovich's work with Sam. And the proposal was made that um, could one make a much bigger device, a bigger work, um, that would incorporate some of those behaviours, but do something much larger. And um, after you know, quite a substantial amount of funding and a lot of experimentation, Ignatovich, create, and working with the robotics lab at UCL, um, Ignatovich created this essentially an articulated neck that would at the top, you've got these microphones that can hear where people are, and it would basically interact with very large crowds who went to see it in its uh, home at the Evolion, and um, caused a great deal of interest in uh, in, 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 in Philips. Um, the trouble was it was too successful, and detracted from people seeing the rest of the exhibition, because everyone wanted to go and talk, <laughs> talk to the censor instead, and people sort of did, did all sorts of things in front of it, and it would sort of look around. So eventually Philips deactivated it. They, they never told Ignatovich that they'd taken it away. And they, uh, they basically, because they said, well, we, we own this work. And um, it was only much later he found out that it was totally decommissioned. And, uh, you know, it had a, a working life of about, I think, three or four years. Or something like that. Not right. So a very, very sad end. But it's gone on to inspire a lot of people who come back to this and think, wow, you know, this was done in what, 1968 to 1970. It's a, it's a more, and, and the back end, by the way, was, um, I think it was a Honeywell computer with about 16K in memory. Yeah. And in that 16K, I mean, Ignatovich learned to program it as well, and, and basically he was able to encode enough in the way of simple movements that were transmitted into the sort of hydraulic systems to create a very lifelike system. But that, to me, is one of the sort of major achievements of the early phase of computer art. You know, not only a, a, a robot, or at least a quasi-robot, but something that was engaging, interactive, very large, and um, sadly also then uh, disappeared almost without a trace, although Ignatovich continued to sort of do, do, do um, other things. And um, that really is where the Computer Art Society comes in. I'm going to time. I think I should do that. <coughs> so as a result of this gentleman here on the left, who appears, Alan Sutcliffe, and John Lansdowne, who was an architect, and the first, I think, yes, probably the first British architect to use computers in his practice, George. I also have Gordon Pass there, just, just so you can get the sense of Gordon Pass as well. But, but basically, George and um, John and Alan, having met up at the um, IFIP conference in 1968, and um, basically IFIP was um, a, a point where um, a lot of... Um, interest was um, expressed in uh, computer music. And that actually was Alan's background. He was you know, a, comp a, a computer programmer. He worked for ICL, but in the evenings, he would use ICL systems to actually start to um, program various uh, sequences of computer music. And he was working with um, Peter Zinoviev, who was actually a, the, f the first really real sort of British developer of um, synthesizers and other, other similar systems. But um, he created some, he wrote a paper called Composing and Computing, and um, that also went into the IFIP Computer Music Contest. He was rather miffed, he always said. It was it got second prize because the artist and architect Xenarchis had uh, come up with another piece of much more sort of well-funded computer music, and that sort of took the top prize. Nonetheless, it was the genesis for the Computer Art Society because he put onto a, a, a bulletin board, a literal in those days, physical bulletin board, um, that he was interested in finding other like-minded people who were looking at computers in the arts. And that's really where George came in, and, and John. And um, from that, they... I'll come back to Gustav in a second. 
they created a, um, actually I'll, I need to zoom back here to the manifesto, because actually they, 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 they came up with a concept for what they call the Computer Arts Society, with a set of aims, um, particularly as they said, the aims are to promote the creative use of computers in the arts, and to encourage the interchange of information in this area, and it talks about the nature of creativity, the nature of computers, and the fact that all the arts, pure and applied, are included, and the fact that they certainly weren't limited to the visual. As I said, Alan was very much into music. John Lansdowne looked at ways to use the computer for dance and for, for other things as well. But many of their projects were, in fact, visual too. And um, we see here as well Gustav Metzger. And I'll tell you about him in a second. So Gustav was also rather in, in, important and influential in the sense that he became the editor for a magazine called oops, oops, Page. And that was the journal that the uh, Computer Art Society came up with. But before that, before Page, they actually had um, an art show called Event One at the uh, Royal College of Art. The first time, in fact, that computers had been used in the RCA, which rather interestingly prefigured what George would later do in terms of setting up the design department, the sort of computer-based design department at the RCA as well. But Event One was an opportunity for a number of artists to collaborate and contribute um, designs to, um, and in, in several cases, working artworks as well. You just see some of those in, in the background, some interactive light pieces and, um, and, and other, other similar works. And um, Metzger had already been interested in the use of the computer. He was actually um, very much a critic of what he saw as, as, as a society that was moving towards nuclear war. He said in, in, in 1968, he said, computers are becoming the most totalitar totalitarian tools ever used on society. But that actually underscored the reasons why he wanted to engage with them. He said, rather than sort of sim simply ignore their existence, rather, rather one should actually grapple with them and understand them better. And this piece that he called Five Screens of the Computer, never built, but um, conceived of several huge um, sort of monolithic steel cages where a computer would, over the course of the years, and I think according to local weather conditions and other things, randomly eject part of the sculpture. Um, in sort of different directions, and so for perhaps for that reason alone, it was never built. But the point is, it would be it would be a sort of a work that stood to represent the gradual sort of decay and collapse of this sort of very computational automated society. But his contributions to Page were especially apt. He was very, very incisive and interesting. He he made a lot of he did a lot of research to bring together the various artists, <coughs> not merely in the UK but across the world, who were at that time using computers. So in this pre-internet age. Having the existence of Page and the Computer Art Society, with, with, which had monthly lectures actually at um, uh, John Lansdowne's base over in, in Russell Square. And the fact is that really sort of okay, it was a catalyst, especially in its earliest years, to bring together all of, all of, these, all of these features. And that really sort of and it had many debates, it had debates about the nature of computer art. Friedman Arthur there saying there should be no computer art. Um, John Lansdowne saying, well, it's far too early to sort of uh, try and cut this off at, at this point, and I, I want to investigate more and, and better. And perhaps their sort of signal achievement, I would say, for these early years was at, um, first at Computer 70, which was um, an exhibition, I think, at Brunel uh, University. Or was, where, or was, was it? Um, Computer 70, I think, was that, uh, was that, that at Earl's Court? That was Earl's Court, sorry, oh, that's yes. right. There, there, there was another, another thing at Brunel. So, yes. Yeah, so, Olympia. Olympia, right. So yes, Computer 70 was, was, was a very large uh, computer trade show, but at Computer 70, um, the EcoGate was proposed and accepted as, as, a, as a work. And that actually involved uh, George's work in, in sort of cybernetic systems and decision making, <coughs> and John Lansdowne's interest in this as well. Basically, it was a dome within which there were several computer terminals. And as it was at a time when computer graphics were not sort of fully real time, what they allowed you to do was control a system of slides. And they invited you to make a series of decisions about, um, basically about environmental and industrial and other sort of uh, decision making as to whether you would sort of prioritize certain factories or certain developments. And even at that early stage, a sense of how the environment might be impacted by sort of some decision making and the, the way that the way that that sort of train of thought was going, would then influence the, the types of slides that were sort of brought up, allowing you to see certain consequences of certain types of perhaps, you know, sort of more profit oriented thinking or more environmentally oriented thinking. And at the time, I think you were, um, the system was, was talking to a, a mainframe. You, you actually had it linked up as a, yeah, both a mainframe and, and a mini computer as well. So it was also actually <coughs> a, um, 
you know, a, an early early type of uh, remote access for computing as well. So, for its time, and especially I think give, given the sort of uh, the, the period, I mean, this interactive game-based and uh, network system, which uh, became the, the eco game, was actually far ahead of its time indeed. And it had a, a second life. It went to Davos. Mm -hmm. the, uh, it went to Davos, didn't yeah. it? The, the eco game. Yeah, the first. Well, I think it was the first <coughs> World Economic Forum. You know, a, a game was sort of, a, I, th I think, a, a first <coughs> as well. And, you know, in many ways, Kaz, which went on to have several other shows, prefigured a lot of these uh, new and evolving concepts. Very quickly, because I'm going to move on to some more contemporary things now. 44 years later, and thanks to um, a group called London Field Works, and also thanks to uh, Bruno Ferrin, um, Gustav Metzger got involved with the Computer Art Society again for another art project. And this was called uh, Gustav Metzger Thinks About Nothing. And the basic idea really was that um, London Fieldworks, which is Joe Joelson and Bruce Gilchrist, um, do a lot of work with scientific process. They're very interested also in remote communications and the way that we sort of conceive of um, other sort of areas. They've done a lot of work, for instance, in the Arctic and remote Scottish islands and transmitted the data back in, in various forms and some sculptural, some, some sort of uh, video based. Um, and uh, Gilchrist had done a lot of work sort of collecting um, vi visual and um, neuro neuropsychological data on people as they perceived different objects um, and, and had turned that into a database. And what he wanted really was to find some way of concretizing those results. And he thought, well, if you could actually get somebody to, as it were, think about nothing and see what form emerged using a, an EEG monitor basically over, over the skull, translating that into a type of shape, you could use that. <laughs> to interrogate the database and create some kind of an object, and that's the sort of positive. But he also wants to find a way to make that sort of real. And he said, well, perhaps that form could then be transmitted to um, a milling robot and excavated out of the block of Portland stone. <coughs> and indeed, this was the way that uh, he got, basically, Gustav to actually sort of participate by not participating, sort of sit, sit there and have his sort of EEG waveforms read from his brain as he tried his best to think of nothing. And then the form that emerged from that translated through the computer into a, into a three-dimensional form, like that looks rather like a, a sort of strange fossil, and then that was actually milled out by the five-axis milling uh, robot and exhibited as, as, a, as, a, as a piece of sculpture, and it was called null object because it's actually a void inside the stone rather than the stone itself. <laughs> and to me, this shows some of the, you know, it's, it's, it's a very perhaps convoluted process, but it's, it's, it says something about the sort of emergence of unusual uh, new, new forms that are both um, entirely sort of intangible, but can actually manifest themselves in a physical way as well. So I was very pleased that Kaz was able to be part of that project and also supported uh, the exhibition on, on it as well. So th this is, uh, you know, um, a nice fitting way, I think, to bring Gustav back into that story. And then the VNA have been very useful they've, they've, because there's this whole issue about you know what do you do with these collections and also is there this sort of canon is there an idea that there's a sort of an ongoing um, stream of computer art that you can identify as a particular history that, that emerges and you know if you read a lot of the histories today they're very much focused on North America for obvious reasons but we're trying also to sort of reset that a little bit and the VNA in 2009 to 10 has an exhibition called Decode um, which showcased many of the more contemporary artists such as Daniel Brown. Um, creating works algorithmic in this case. This is based on the algorith algorithmic growth of plants, of growth and form, and so it happens also at the same time that ah, I didn't, it's a slide that I missed out. Drag. Um, at the same time, they also have a historic exhibition of, of computer-based art as well. But I want to show you something that we did in 2012 to 13 called Intuition and Ingenuity. Now, the year 2012 should be very significant yeah. for computationally minded people because that was the anniversary of Alan Turing. Uh, Alan Turing, exactly. Yes, well done. And his phrase, intuition and ingenuity, was one of the sort of expressions he had to, to express, you know, to sort of s summarize how he came up with some of his ideas, <laughs> both a combination of intuition and ingenuity. And um, it was shown in a, quite a number of places, uh, the Nice House in Brighton, for instance, and uh, Sue Golfer, who was the main curator, is, is here as well, and Alan Dimitri and, and, and myself were, were involved. And it did eventually go to Bletchley Park, which was uh, very appropriate. What you see there, um, something we'll return to, is actually a, a computer-generated um, 
drawing of uh, Turing's visage. And it was a way of pulling together, really, a number of artists who'd already collaborated with um, the Computer Art Society, but particularly were interested in um, the use of Turing machines, the use of evolution, the use of algorithmic forms. Uh, William Latham, a long-standing artist in this area, who's done a lot with uh, evolutionary algorithms and um, was one of the earliest, in fact, to explore that, that field. He was doing a, a work called Organic TV. But uh, his more recent work, uh, Mutator VR, he, he works a lot with Goldsmiths um, College, University of London. And Mutator VR translates a lot of that into virtual space. And um, I was actually, I saw him last night at the Crick Institute, and he's now working with um, a, a team of scientists looking at the development of cancer cells. And he's actually tuned or, or changed the forms of Mutator VR to look at the sort of, to actually visualize the growth of cancer, cancer cells and also to guide you through a sort of interactive journey, trying to sort of expose them using light and sort of see, see them in their sort of natural, well, kind of natural form, visualized form, I would say. But it does sort of involve you and sort of put you into a world that's not only usually invisible, but actually is very hard to visualize. And that's one of the strengths, I think, of this, this form is that you can actually um, sort of turn, turn, turn not only the, the, the invisible visible, but also expose growth and change in a way that perhaps, you know, sort of older art forms uh, find more difficult and um, it bridges a number of areas as well. So Latham's Organic TV is very interesting. Similar sort of vein, Gordon Research um, created a piece called Fragments of Lost Flight. In this case, sort of building wing fragments using um, basically a, a basic Turing machine. And um, that sort of um, developed sort of the, the, you can see there's an overall shape to it, but each individual form is actually more easily seen here springs up and develops and then dies off um, gradually so that you get this sort of wing-like form but also individual feathers changing and, um, and, and uh, developing. So board and research, that's Vicky Ivey and Paul Smith who are, who are based in Southampton. And they show also the possibilities for collaboration. There's a lot of collaborative teams working as sort of computer artists as well as individuals. And I think it's interesting that they bring their sort of varied expertise in, in that sort of way. Paul Brown, um, actually a... Uh, a former chair of the Computer Art Society himself, but also very much interested in um, morphogenesis and uh, the change of, of, of forms, cellular forms especially. And he's done a lot with tiling and symmetry, but also he's interested in uh, the game of life, in Conway's uh, mathematical game of life. So he's been using that as a basis for creating evolutionary forms of a very different kind to Latham's, but you can see that um, you know, sort of resulting in, in sort of a much more abstract um, um, as, as he said, it's, it's the way that, um, for instance, uh, tiger stripes, leopard spots, other sort of forms in, um, in, in terms of natural camouflage can appear as well. And then Ernest Edmonds, who's been working on interactive systems really since the, the 1960s, um, does works that actually respond to each other. They're, they're, they're actually um, quite sort of slow pieces of interactivity, but they're placed in, in different areas where they can not only respond to people around them, gradually changing form and shape, but also can sort of talk to each other in remote locations. And since he moves a lot between Australia and the UK, therefore he often does those sort of uh, rem remote things with, with them. And um, it takes, in this case, takes data from a camera and continuously calculates the amount of activity seen, and this steadily modifies the rules of the piece, changing the form. So it's a representation, he says, of computed life, moving and changing at its own accord. And finally, um, in this sort of selection, I mentioned Patrick Tresse. Um, you saw the, the portrait of uh, Turing. Well, Tresse has developed a system called Paul that is actually um, a some, somewhat intelligent um, artist um, to the extent that it encodes the movements and some of the aesthetic choices that Tresse makes when he himself was um, still making art. Because interestingly, Tresse is um, in his. In his, his, his had a career both as, as an artist and also a computer programmer. Um, but he suffered greatly from, um, I think, bipolar disorder. And at one stage was um, taking drugs, obviously, to help suppress some of the sort of the, the effects of this. And he said, well, although that leveled me out in terms of my own, um, in, in, in terms of my own sort of psyche, unfortunately, it more or less destroyed my ability to create as well. So what he wanted to develop instead was what he called a prosthesis for creativity and externalise some of the processes that uh, he was originally using for um, his art. And the result, after quite a lot of research and, and his PhD, was the system called Paul, which in effect uh, uses a, you know, this is the, the simpler and earlier form of Paul, 
uses a webcam to um, capture the image of the sitter, and then <laughs> an articulated arm. Um, I think it's using um, it's probably using our Arduino, but it's, it's basically sort of um, a, a small interconnected um, box that can sort of maneuver, basically sort of take the commands and maneuver the pen around the, the page. And they form really um, impressions based on his own sort of choices, but also the machine's own understanding of the human face. And it has continuous line, so it sort of picks up, um, sort of, and you know, it, it, it doesn't have any sort of uh, sense of, how should I say, of, um, so it's, it's not able to change the mark, as it were, but rather, rather builds up marks through one continuous line changing. It actually has an interesting character in itself. But by far the most, you know, sort of uh, curious part of the piece is the number of people who come just to watch the process. That seeing this arm moving of its own accord and able to able to capture the face and, and, and doing something that you know you might associate with a human artist actually has a great um, uh, sort of fascination for people. And that some some of his more recent works involve multiple iterations of Paul all working together. And the one I saw most, most recently was set up rather like a classroom, and there was um, a projection on the wall, just sort of three simple marks. And most of the machines were set to sort of copy that, but every so often one would depart from that and sort of decide not to draw that and would draw something else, sort of changing the, the uh, development of the, of the piece. This would bring us more closely up to date. Uh, Electronic Superhighway at the Whitechapel, you know, 2016, some point, was that 60 years after This Is Tomorrow. Um, it was actually Omar Khalif was the uh, curator here. <laughs> And he looked at the development of new media art, perhaps a sort of more general area than sort of just uh, computer-based art. But what he did was actually take you back through time, sort of starting off with the most recent new media works and taking you back to uh, the sort of origins of it. And yeah, it was, the show was quite well received. Um, interesting to see major galleries starting to take on now sort of some sort of understanding of what the digital art involves. And I think this shows that this is gradually and in some sort of quarters beginning to break out perhaps into a more mainstream form. Um, the existence of places like the ZKM, the Zentrum for Kunst Media, um, or Media and Technology in Karlsruhe, um, a key centre actually for um, a lot of uh, very influential uh, new media arts, especially the works of Jeffrey Shaw, um, of uh, Eliasson, of course, and others, but, um, you know, having these centres, I think, also, in a, it's also an archival centre as well as a place where a lot of the uh, early works of video art and, um, and new media art are, are sort of preserved and, and kept working. So the ZKM has, has a multiple function and shows that um, these, 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 you know, these, these works are sort of make, making their way into, into the wider world. And ours Electronica, which is in Linz, in Austria, um, the festival actually started as a, a festival of video art in 1979, but has since acquired a, a building. It's sort of developed into an actual research centre. It's now sort of got much more of a, a, a sort of solid presence as well as a festival. And that is a place where, if you look through the archives, you'll see the evolution of the more recent digital aesthetic. You'll see through the prizes that they award, there's the trees, ours, Electronica and others, and through that you will see what was considered to be at the cutting edge of digital art all the way really through, through the last 40 years or so. And an organisation that I'm involved with a lot, and I, 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 I like being part of the Lumen Prize, I'm a former director and I'm still sort of involved with sort of change that every so often, but I'm also involved as a judge as well. The Lumen Prize, which was founded by uh, Carla Rappaport, who's uh, an American journalist based actually in Wales, um, also where I come from, um, but uh, Carla was very intrigued by um, the exhibition that David Hockley did of iPad works and thought she, she came from pretty much a, a non-arts world background, but she thought, well, there must be a lot of interesting computer-based artwork out there that isn't sort of getting the um, exposure that it deserves. Is there some way to sort of bring that to the fore? And so um, she has organised then this prize since 2012, which actually covers a number of different areas. There's, apart from the sort of the main award, the, the gold award, there's also awards there, I mean, Category has changed, but this year it's movie image, still image, 3D interactive, VR and AR, the Founders Award, which can, you know sort of is, is actually hers to sort of push to, to a particular pe um, piece, People's Choice, which is based on internet voting, and last year and again this year the BCS Artificial Intelligence Award, um, which is actually aimed at sort of uh, investigating AI-based uh, based works as well, and also a student award too, but. To my mind, this covers a lot of the sort of possibilities that exist at the moment in the field of uh, um, digital digital art, and I think point towards ways in which the, the, the form is evolving. 
and um, we can't, I, I suppose, sort of keep it in sort of any one category, as may have been implied by this term computer art, because people are sort of branching off into these very different media. And I think we see, particularly with VR and AR, the emergence of a, uh, another medium within the sort of broad sort of area of, of computer based art. <coughs> and just, when you sort of see it at, at its best, and I think, um, you know, the interesting thing with Lumen is that the way it travels around the world to all, all sorts of different venues some of which are better prepared than others for the arrival of sort of computer-based work. And I have to say, from, from my experience, the Onassis Cultural Center, which is in Athens, was um, actually very, very well kitted out and set out. And um, I think give, given its role as a sort of place of, of you know, design shows and other things, it it's actually was, was far better um, at showing digital original works than perhaps um, a, a more sort of standard art gallery or museum. I mean, we usually, as part of the Lumen show, we kind of bring our own expertise, so we actually transport the projectors, the computers, everything. It's, it's a vast thing to set up. You may think the computer art is somehow portable simply because we're so used to you know, the small devices that we carry around today, but if you want to show it at its best, and if you want to sort of show it with sort of full-size projectors, like for instance this one, then actually the transportation is far more involved than merely taking sort of flat pieces of artwork around and hanging them on the wall. <coughs> and I think partly for this reason, and partly for the sort of back end st still needed to actually see born digital work in its original form. Um, I, it's part of the reason I, th I think it still hasn't quite crossed the Rubicon in, in, in some areas, that the expertise for showing it is, is not as widespread as, as, as one might think. That is changing. I think as, as more galleries and others invest in new forms of digital projection, and I think also just the improvements in screen technology over the last few years. I mean, I, I recently saw that you can pick up a 4K projector for £1,500, which is quite extraordinary. You know, I mean, a home cinema spec sort of 4K projector, which to my mind, you know, this is something that even a few, literally a year ago, might have cost over 4000 So, I mean, there's, you know, the, somebody like me who was, was used to trying to set up very sort of primitive VGA projectors and trying to get a, a good image out of an old-fashioned iPad, for instance. I mean, this is, you know, it's a, it's a step in, in pretty much the right direction. And just to take you through a couple of our winners from the last couple of years, I'm, I'm almost there. Um, Katerina Afana Sopalu, um, she was actually an artist who was based at the, um, at the RCA, but um, created um, this, this piece that was called Apotomy. Whoops. And um, Apotomy was actually um, had an interesting philosophical basis. It was looking at um, the concepts of uh, Plato's idea of the human soul as a birdcage. And it was also reflecting on the sort of situation in Greece at the time, the sort of economic crash, the sort of abandonment of a lot of buildings and things, and what she created was um, a partly built 3D city with this roadway going through, within which travelling along it was actually a cage on wheels with the human souls inside it, as it were, like um, a sort of travelling cage. And the camera moves around and takes in this sort of half-built and de deserted city. And um, she basically sort of understood that as a uh, sort of metaphor and um, <laughs> For, for sort of Greek condition at that time, but also it makes for a very interesting aesthetic experience as well, especially the details that she focuses on and the way that it develops. So, you know, proving that there's some, some in, interesting depth to that work. So that was the winner from uh, 13. Andy Lomas from 2014, um, a visual effects artist who's now actually moved fully into creating uh, computer-based art, works now at the Barkins Institute, and he was also inspired by growth and form, this time sort of evolving structures it's a very, uh, it's worth looking at in its animated form. I'm sorry, I haven't, I haven't shown animation simply because I have a lot to get through, but um, the animation of this structure developing <laughs> and decaying and dying is, is, is and it's, it's very, it's monochrome and it's actually done in a very abstract way, but it's nonetheless quite disturbing. And there's a very interesting sort of gothic almost um, aesthetic going on there, but it's actually entirely algorithmic. It is not really based on anything apart from the, um, his sort of selection of particular algorithms as, 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 as the forms that, that, he, that he wants. So although there's a beauty to it, it's also a naturally disturbing sort of experience as well. 2015, Ruth Gibson and Bruno Martelli, um, a work called Man A, uh, obviously referencing the pages of two, but in fact inspired by the camouflage used by um, ships in the, uh, the First World War. And as you can see there, it's an augmented reality piece. It's, it's produced as, as prints that in themselves are interesting, you don't necessarily know what they do, but if you take um, an iPad um, or a tablet with the app on it and start to move that across, you'll see it's inhabited by three-dimensional dancers. And the performers move through the stripes and sort of basically sort of inhabit that 
inhabit that shape, but you can't see them, of course, with the naked eye. They're, they're only there whenever you sort of use the electronic overlay. So um, that's a, that was a, an interesting work as well. They've done a lot with augmented and virtual art. I do recommend seeing some of the works they've done, particularly like this called Vermilion Lake, where in fact the interface was a boat. And it was set in the Canadian Arctic, and basically you would row your way through the experience. But in fact, of course, because as a rower, you face backwards. The whole thing was done in such a way that you only ever saw where you were going from, rather than what you were heading towards. So, um, <laughs> yes, they've done several works on that sort of line as well. Uh, 2016, uh, Fabio Giampietro and Alessio De Vecchi, Hyperplanes of Simultaneity, is actually a hand-drawn virtual reality piece. It, you're inside a city that, as you can see, is sort of falling in on itself, and the sort of preparation of the canvas was um, a very long and uh, dedicated task, but it was then filmed in, in the round, and so most of the people saw it not as a physical work, but actually in, in, a, in a, basically a, in the phone-based um, sort of uh, Google um, sort of, uh, phone, uh, Google Cardboard-based um, uh, VR system. And what was very intriguing about this, it was hand-drawn and static. And yet, as you walk through it, you, you, know, you could walk so far and, and you'd come to the edge of a building. And the number of people who, even though it was perfectly static and didn't really have any, it certainly wasn't naturalistic as such, but the number of people who paused at the edge and actually seemed to be able to, you know, seemed to think they were about to plunge over into the abyss because it was a very high sort of skyscraper and then you were surrounded by some of these sort of high buildings as well. It's just interesting to see that reaction. And the number of people who'd never actually used VR or AR before that we sort of introduced to it and got to understand the work in, in, in those terms, and it was very, very interesting indeed. And then last year's uh, winner, Plastic Reflectic, is actually about the, um, it's more of a sort of all interactive piece, looking at the build-up of plastic in the ocean, so it's got a sort of a, a message behind it as well, but also, as you can see there, it responds to the forms that somebody is uh, putting in front of it, making the human form built entirely out of plastic, and in this bath-like reflector as well. So these. We, you know, I think that the winners have been both, um, you know, sort of show sort of interesting development there of, of uh, new, new technologies. And then Frank, Artificial Intelligence by Cecile Wagner Falkenstrom, was the winner of the Artificial Intelligence Award last year. And what it is, is actually, it's <coughs> nothing visual about it at all. You've actually just got a voice talking to you. And Frank is a kind of oracle. It seems to be super intelligent. Um, but it sort of gives you very ambiguous responses, the sort of things you might get from tarot cards, for instance. That sort of it's, it's, it's artificial intelligence, but it chops up the um, responses and sort of makes you question really how um, sort of uh, clever it really is, and um, really what one can sort of draw out of it. And there's a sort of aspect of manipulation, an aspect of uh, user response there. But Frank is um, interesting simply because it's invisible. It's a sort of it's just an audible work of art. And there. Take us more or less up to the present. That's that's where I shall leave you. Thank you very much.